Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Listen, you, you'll get something out of this that'll help you. Trust me. Hallelujah. Praise God. God's so awesome, isn't he? Yeah, we're going to start at verse 3. God's good pleasure. You know, there's a, a verse in the Old Testament that says, Come freely and drink from the rivers of God's pleasure. You know, we have a right to it. I mean, you can bend down there and just drink to your fill of the pleasure of God. You can wade out in it. You can splash that pleasure water on each other. You can put your face down in it and blow bubbles. You can dive into it. You can begin to swim. You can do the backstroke. You can, you can just have a wonderful time in the rivers of God's pleasure, right? But the first thing is you have to convince yourself that you have the ability and the right to be in there. And that's where the heart comes in. And that's the reason I believe that God started from the very beginning, back in the garden. When the first sacrifice, blood sacrifice that was given, and that kidney and the fat around it was, was burnt, and then it was, it was used later, you know, for the anointing oil and, and for perfume and things, right? So there's something about that kidney. And the thing that is about it is that it is the center, it is the core, and it is a representation, it is a type and shadow, right? That type and shadow literally is, is the Bible calls your heart. Now, it's not your blood pump, come on now, but it's the core of your being, it literally is the center of your soul. And in the center of your soul is where the, the, the holiness is. Your spirit man, born again, is the holy of holies. It can't get any more holy, right? You can't add to your spirit. You can't educate your spirit. Your spirit is trying to educate you. First John says that in your spirit, you know all things. You have no need of anyone teach you concerning the things of God because your spirit man understands, right? But that spirit man has been shut up in a closet somewhere. And Paul calls him the hidden man of the heart. What do we do? We hide him. That part that got recreated when you got born again, old things passed away. What passed away? The human nature that you were. You become a divine nature. You become a child of God, born from the incorruptible seed from God's own loins. We were born, begotten from the truth and reality of the Word of God. I am who He says I am. I can do what he says I can do. And I can have what he says I can have. And he gave me full right and authority to receive freely of the entire finished work of Christ. Because everything that Jesus did, he did for me. And he did for you. And you need to look at that and see that God was in preparation for 4,000 years for your birthday celebration. And when you took on a new life on the inside, it was subdominant to the natural man, to the natural soul, right? Even though all old things were passed away, you still have the imprint, the memory imprint. And that imprint is in your heart, right? The core of your being. And that's the reason that all of you think you are who you are. But if you ever found out that you're not who you are, then you begin to see a change on the outside and things begin to happen. 
See, the Bible really doesn't tell us to get down and pray for more money and pray for healing and pray for this. We can do that, right? Because we're moving out of who we think we are, that we used to be, into who we are in Christ Jesus, right? But if you stood on righteousness alone, any and everything you need in life will just show up. Because we're still hung up on asking. Now here's the problem with asking God for things. Automatically you say you don't have it. See, your brain will say, I've got everything. It's a finished work. It's a done deal. Praise God. I have everything. I have that new car in Jesus' name. I have money. I have this. I have that. I have whatever it is. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I have it. And then that heart says, oh, God. (laughs) See? And that heart says, I don't really have it. But I was taught if I said I did, then it would come. So the heart is here saying, okay, where's it at? (laughs) Where's it at? I did the things. I did the confession. I get up and I do it every morning. Praise God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And we go through our confessions. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. But what I'm saying is, is if your confession and your belief and your faith in the finished work of Christ is not changing your heart. Okay. Here's how you know that there's an effect going on in your heart. It changes attitudes, it changes emotions, right? It changes philosophy uh, or mindsets, right? And so a lot of us still have all of that force and control that we've gathered along our whole life. Trust me, there isn't anything you've ever experienced or done in your entire life that your heart has forgotten. It knows it. It knows exactly every single thing you went through. Now, see, in your brain, you say, praise God, I forgive them. I set aside. Nah, it doesn't bother me. Hallelujah. You know, just check your emotions. And then all of a sudden, it's like, and see, it's not conscious. So you don't think it matters, but down here in the subconscious is saying, how do they always get blessed? Oh, but rejoice with those that rejoice. You know, cry with those that suffer. And praise God, I'm a, I'm a good little child. So I'm going to rejoice. I'm so glad you got that 12th new car. I'm so thrilled. I'm so excited for you. And I'm going to drive my old beat-up jalopy around just thanking God that you have all these cars and no time to drive them. (laughs) Come on now. And see, down here, if you really had the effect and the authority on the inside to change that, if, if, if that joy, that happiness came out of your heart and you're pleased with other people. See, then God says that that same thing will visit you. Okay. We all think that there's things that we've been believing for and praying for that one day we're going to get them. One day it's going to come in. Well, listen, I did that about a lot of things, but you know what? It's been so long, I don't need them now. And it took so long, I just went and did my own. Right? I prayed for that car. I needed that car. I was traveling the highways. I was preaching, and I needed that car. Well, I just went ahead and got it on payments. See, what am I saying? I'm saying, if you can't come through, I'll do it. But we would rather him come through so it won't cost us. <laughs> anyway, come on now. Is it all right to get real this morning? We're going to celebrate my birthday. 
Hallelujah. Amen. So if you don't smile, you don't get to eat. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at God's goodness. Say God's goodness. Say it again. God's goodness. He's a good God. See, it's completely, totally against his nature to bless one person and not another. Now, I've, I've said this many, many, many times. You might need to write it down. God had one of two choices concerning you. That's not a, a bad thing, right? What's concerning you, he just says, I got two options. Okay, option number one. Aren't you glad there's not three? <laughs> option number one. Option number one, I'm not going to give you anything. What have you ever done to deserve anything? You get nothing unless you can prove to me that I can trust you with it. Right? Option number one. See, some of you think that you fell in that category. Option number two. Right? Option number two, I will give you everything there is. And I will qualify you. And you can have everything that I have. And that's the one that he chose. You say, how did he choose it? He chose it in Christ when he hung on the cross. And the blood of God gushed from his body. The blood of Jesus is the most valuable thing in existence. Not even a part of a single drop can be compared to the wealth of the whole universe. It pales in comparison to one drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he didn't get up there and say, let's be blood brothers and sisters. And I'll cut a little bit, and get some blood there. You cut a little bit and we'll mix our bloods. See, and that's how we look at it. What he did is he emptied his body of all the blood that coursed through it. He was drained dry. Not a drop left. And then he went into the belly of the earth for those three days. And when he came out, he came out victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Right? Right? And then he took that blood and he carried it into the heavens and he anointed the heavenly altars and it slammed the door and kicked the devil out. No more accusations. See, Satan could just go right in there with his accusations. He had a right because he came in on the authority of Adam's transgression. But when the second Adam voluntarily emptied his body of that blood and stripped hell of its power and its keys and he entered into heaven and cleansed the utensils and the altar, he shut everything out and now Satan is a liar. There's a difference between lying and accusing. You make accusations because they're based on partial truths. Lies aren't based on anything, no truth. 
And so every time those thoughts of yours starts filtering up saying, I wonder when it's going to happen. I wonder if today might be the day that healing will come to me. I wonder why it's taking God so long for that financial miracle. Will God do it? And all these wonderings and things start going on. You see, those have all been shut out of heaven. The only thing that's in heaven is that you should prosper as your soul prospers and be in health. The only thing that rings in heaven is enter into my goodness. Receive freely as much as you desire. And we got little human preachers running around because they're so afraid that Christians might get a little more than they should. And so they're trying to preach condemnation on everybody. You think God is going to bless you after what you did? Well, listen, he blessed me when I didn't know there was good. <laughs> he watched over me. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, he better bless me. All right? I'm blessed what? From a finished work of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath past tense already done, signed, sealed, delivered, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Where? In the heavenly places in Christ. In the heavenly places in Christ. Blessed with what? All spiritual blessings. All. Every one. Not one left out. All blessings we've been blessed with in Christ. In Christ. Now here's the thing. See, religious people get hair-lipped over this because they think it's, it's coming on you in you. No, it's in Christ. It's in Christ. Right? Why? So that it'll be secure. So that it'll be in full power all the time. Once you realize you're in Christ, then you've been sealed and locked up for eternity. Inside him, where all the blessings are. They're all around you. Everything's there, right? But if we go through the renewing of our mind and we yield our heart to God, that the Holy Spirit, through the grace of God, begins to change everything that's in there. And one day, effortlessly, you're going to wake up and you're going to realize, duh, it's mine. It's always been mine. It's always been mine. But we've been under an influence of this natural world and a man's attempts to try to preach and teach the things of God, right? And all this mix and mess has entered down into our heart and it's subconsciously controlling our life. So the mind gets into the Word of God and says, I can be blessed. I have all the spiritual blessings in Jesus' name, in Christ. Hallelujah. So the brain is like, all right, praise God. It's about time we start changing our life. It's about time some of this money starts coming to me. It's about time that the healing and the things come. It's about time you know, that, that my loved ones change their lives. And, and, and the brain is just seeing all these possibilities and everything because of Jesus, because of the finished work, and it's there. And so it's becoming enlightened to it. But your brain isn't the power of your life. Abel didn't offer a sheep brain. As a matter of fact, I don't remember ever reading ever where they offered brains. As a holy sacrifice. That may sound funny, but man, that is phenomenal truth. So 
Our life basically is resting on our brain and our knowledge. Come on. When God said, give me some heart. Just give me some heart. Amen? How many of you, when you started courting or dating, you just couldn't hardly wait to see that special person? And then you finally might have got to hug them, and you hugged them, and you said, I love you with all my brain. (laughs) You're moping around, and somebody says, what's wrong? Oh, my brain hurts. And then they walk away and they dump you and they break your brain. (laughs) But aren't we still looking for our brain to bail us out? If it's not working the way I want, what do I do? I got to get some more knowledge. I got to get some. Oh, you should have heard so. Was he good? Yeah. Where's he at? (laughs) Give me that next CD. You know what's funny? See, the brain, just a little side game. The brain, so we got a lot of CDs back there that really are worthless. (laughs) Uh, Of all the teaching that I've done. And if, if, if someone's brain kind of ignites and says, we ought to buy one of those CDs. See, we'll go over there and we'll shuffle through them and, and, and try to find the newest one. This one's really a good one. I know, but that, that's last year's. What's the date on it? Hello? Hello? Come on, you, you know, the, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm really giving you some awesome stuff here. It's going to change your life if you'll catch it, if you'll catch it. Now, now, now don't anybody go back there and, and buy a CD. No, that's not reverse psychology either, <laughs> you know. Don't. I'm just saying the brain, right? The brain says, when was this written? Like, do you know your Bible is 2,000 years old? And if someone came up with a CD that was, that was taught by Apostle Paul himself, would you walk by it? Right? I mean, so we are determining the value Come on. And the Bible says in the parable of the sower, he says what value you place on the word of God is the value of what's going to come back into your life. Now, I, I, I learned the hard way. I'd listen to Kenneth Hagin and, and, and uh, I mean, I'd, I'd drive however far, you know, if he was anywhere close. And I'd go in there and I'd listen. And it, it'd say, open your Bibles to Mark 11. I thought, God, doesn't he know anything else? I drove 300 miles. And so among a bunch of us, you know, we started, we, 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 we'd call it Hagen 11. <laughs> what did he preach? Hagen 11. <laughs> yeah. Come on. And then someone asked him, said, Dr. Hagen, every time I come to your service, you, you're, somehow, somewhere, you're going to Mark 11. He says, um, I'm, I'm sure you know other things. He said, when are you going to see something else? He says, as soon as you get this. <laughs> he said, I've been praying and praying that people would start getting it so I could preach something else. 
He said, but God said, preach Mark 11 until people get it. Right? So our brain is accustomed to it. Just like we get accustomed to Jesus. He's with us. He's around us. He's somewhere. It's like that little boy, you know, he, he was, came home, he was all worried, and, and his mother says, what's wrong? He says, well, I was at Sunday school, he says, the Sunday school teacher looked at me and says, have you found Jesus? And I said, I didn't even know he's missing. <laughs> he says, so I ran home. I said, why'd you run home? He says, because I don't want to be accused of taking him. <laughs> Where's Jesus. Where's Jesus, right? Where is that life that was a free gift that was given to us? We have every spiritual blessing known to God. And we're looking for something. Come on. God's good pleasure. Now watch this, verse 4. According as he has blessed us in him before the foundation of the world. Now was that back further than your past? So could I, could I safely say you haven't done anything in your past that would disqualify you? When he considered you blessed with all spiritual blessings before the foundation of the world, Right? He says, but we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Oh, you mean this isn't just about what we can get? No, it's about what you can become. Yes. Right? So if we're looking at everything, we've got it. It's a done deal. It's a finished work. We have everything. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. My gosh, there isn't anything I can want or need. God's gave me everything. But have we considered that he connected with that, that we should become blameless in love? Blameless in love. See, the reason that we don't really embrace that as much is because we already know we can't do it. We can't do that. I can't, I can't love everybody. Man, follow me around for a while. I can't love everybody. Well, listen, you can't heal yourself either. You can't make money come to you. From unexpected sources. As a matter of fact, you can't get and cause anything that God has done and given because of your works. But somehow, see, we separate that. These are the things that Jesus done, and he's done them for me, praise God, and I'm believing for them, and I'm confessing them, and I'm getting, and these are the things that Jesus wants us to do. Well... I would rather attempt to get the things that I can't get on my own because I already know I can't do the things that he wants me to do on my own. And yet both of them are gifts. They're gifts. The Holy Spirit is inside your kidney. He's inside your heart, right? Knocking. And he says what? If anyone will open the door, I will come in and I will sup with you. Now, so we use that as being born again, and yet it's not talking about born again. He's not going to knock on the door of your heart until after you're born again. Then he's knocking on the door of your heart because he, he is a gentleman in certain senses, right? And he's saying, if you'll let me in, let's come and dine. He says, I've got this. If you'll give me the opportunity, 
I will cause your heart to change effortlessly so that you can begin to be the product or the person or the model or the image of who my Father desires you to be because you're in me. And when God looks at me, he sees you. He doesn't look at you to see me. Hello. God's good pleasure. Verse 6. To the praise and the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us. Come on, let's read it like it is. See, this isn't your confession. This isn't your hopes and dreams. This is a reality. This is a done deal. This is the way God sees you and the way God made you. And if He made you that way, that's, that's how you are right now. He says, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Made us accepted in the beloved. Made us accepted in the beloved. We still got this, this idea that I need to get better. I, I know, I know, I know. You don't have to say anything. I know, 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 I know. Okay, I need to be better. There's some things I need to change. I know, and, 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 and you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get around to it. I, I, you know, I'm working on it. All right? You know, you know why that's a lie? Because basically, you don't have a clue how to do it. All you know is you need to be different. And it just seems too hard. Or I don't want to do it. You mean I can really come to a place where I can love them? I'm not sure I want to. Oh, no, that's honesty. That's what God loves. Honesty. Now, Lord, now they just really hurt me and said some things and stuff, and I know you said that I got to love them, and... and I love them. I love them. See, but we're not doing what he said. We're just trying to get a pat on the head. Right? And then you see him. I love them. And the brain is going. Where's a good place to hide a body? <laughs> Ask Siri. Right. What I'm saying is that, see, God isn't thrilled after you get everything done and all cleaned up. And your, your, your attitudes are changed and everything. He said, what? Just as I am. It's an offering. I offer you my heart. I offer you my life. How many of you know that God already knows he got the short end of the deal? Huh? Didn't he? Do you know that, that he knew when you came to him to accept him, he already knew that you really weren't all that much? The angels in heaven are shouting. And it wasn't because of what you've accomplished. It's because you what? surrendered. Come on, there's some powerful keys here. That surrendered. Paul put it this way. I beat my body into subjection and submission daily. Why? Because it wants to go do its old thing. See, we're comfortable in who we believe we are. We're comfortable. As a matter of fact, there's some teaching out there that tells us we can be who we are because God loves variety. That's not what the Bible says. It says God's desire and hope for us 
is that we be conformed and changed into the express image of Jesus Christ. Oh, you just think that everybody's going to be like little Jesus is running around. Well, God thinks it. I didn't say I did. I know you. <laughs> and I know me. <laughs> right? See, I'm more like Jesus on Sunday mornings. <clears throat> Come on now. But see, God says, whoa, Danny, picks me up, gives me a big smooch and says, you're just like your big brother. <laughs> huh? The Holy Spirit stands by your bed, looking at you every twitch, every turn, waiting for those lovely eyes to pop open. Because he wants to fellowship with you. Right? And sometimes he'll invade your dreams because he can't wait. If we begin to change our perception, our idea of who God is and his love for us and who we are, right? And that he knew what he was getting when he bought you. It's called redeemed. We're redeemed by what? Watch this. We won't go too much longer. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption, we've been redeemed through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, his good pleasure, his good pleasure pleasure which he hath purposed in himself he purposed in himself this good pleasure that he could abound with toward you the most valuable thing in existence his very own blood that pumped from his veins He said, what? He says, this was the redemption. This is the price. What did he pay for your soul? What did he pay to elevate you out of this world into heavenly places? What did it cost him? What price was he willing to give? He gave it all. He did not leave one drop back, gave it all. And he looked at you as an individual. He says, you're worth every drop. You're worth every drop. <laughs> and our heart says, no way. No. And David cried out and he says, what is man? What? is man that you would love him we could never blame God if he turned his back on us and walked away we have nothing we had nothing he had everything and he said what a great deal and swapped. And he took our nothing and gave us his everything. He says, now in me, you've got the mysteries of the kingdom. You've got all the spiritual blessings. You've got the power. You've got the authority. You've got the life. You've got the abundance. You're not of this world, even though you're in it. You are my child. My child. What would you like? What would you like? Listen, let's make this real easy. Let's don't have you just come and ask me and try to get something from. Let me just give you everything and then you've got everything there is. 
And that's the choice he made. I'll give you everything. The problem is you have minds, <laughs> brains, and brains get in the way. So John the Baptist shows up, eating big grasshoppers, clothed in camel skin. Somebody told me that they're the worst smelling animal ever, and even worse when they get wet. He's standing out in the river, saying, come unto me, and be baptized. But see, what was that first word he said? I skipped it. He said what? Repent. Repent. And so religious brains grabbed hold of it and says, repent is be real sorry for all that stuff you did. Listen, we were just living the life we knew. We didn't know anything else. So why do I have to tell him I'm sorry? You need to come up and tell God you're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, God, I'm sorry. And the heart's going, for what? Right? See, but repent means change brains. Change brains. He stood out in that river and he says... The kingdom of God is coming, but you got to change brains because it's going to pass you by with your brains. Right? So, might I say, maybe we haven't totally changed brains like we need to to keep things from passing by? It isn't about your labor. It isn't about your work. It isn't about what you can do and what you can't do. Listen, I don't care who you are. It'll never be enough. It's when you take on the right brain and you say, God, here am I. Whatever it is that I need to do to get my life changed, I can't do it. So here I am. And God says... Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, Holy Ghost, did you see that? <laughs> you see that heart opening up? Oh, get him! <laughs> and then he just hits you in the middle of the heart. He just go, oh, God. And effortlessly, you begin to change. You see things different. Your perception is different. All your old life just, yes. just fades away. Everything in your life that's been a problem just dissolves and is washed away. And you begin to see God in a different way. You begin to see yourself in Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you begin to see what the power of grace is. Grace is God in you doing what you can't do. You can't believe God for the things that you're trying to do. You need to open up and say it is by grace and grace alone. It is a grace gospel. He is a grace God. And it is by grace that His graced children are blessed and more than conquerors and overcomers, it is by grace. Meaning what? It's not my labor. It's not my work. It's been done. It's been finished. It's been paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood is still the power of God. That blood is still the power that changes hearts. It changes minds. It changes lives. It is the blood of God. The blood of Christ. It is by His blood. And that is the river that he has welcomed me to, to come and drink freely, to come and swim and spend time in that refreshing blood of Christ, knowing 
that I have now become more like him. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. And God begins to open my eyes and my mind and begins to show me things that I've never even dreamt of, never even thought of, never even heard of. And yet he says, you think that's something? Listen to this. He says, I already set into motion for all eternity, and that's going to be a long time. All eternity, every day in eternity, I'm going to show you something new. And then the next day, I'll show you something new. I'll show you something better. I'll show you something greater. I'll show you something for how long? Because soon, somewhere along the line, we've got to hit the end of everything. And God says, I have no end. I am endless. He says, I dare you. I command you, come search me out. Don't live your life in that little pup tent. Get out and come and find me. Come and see me. Come and dwell with me. He says, I can do more in your life in five minutes than you can in your entire life. The time it takes you to take a good breath, your whole life can be radically changed and you'll never be the same. But you got to let go of who you think you are. And you got to let go from a heart level uh, of, of whether you think that you're doing the right things in, in order to, to earn what it is you're getting. Right? It isn't about authority and power. We've got power over the devil. Well, some kind of big deal. He has no power. That's the reason they came back rejoicing. We got power on the devil. And Jesus said, get a clue. Don't rejoice because you have power over him. He said, wait a little bit. I'm going to strip everything he's got. He said, rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You've got my life. Now, that's something worth getting in a hoedown on. Come on, man. Hallelujah, I've got the life of God. I've got the life of God in me. Praise God, amen. Hallelujah, did you get something out of that? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We're more than conquerors. <laughs>